What can I do to prevent a stroke or heart attack? The ways to prevent stroke and heart attack, and we'll lump that as cardiovascular disease. They're both very similar and they affect very different organs. A heart attack is basically a blockage of the arteries of the heart. A stroke could be caused by a blockage of the arteries of the brain or damage to the vessels of the brain from high blood pressure or pieces of plaque breaking off from arteries in the neck going to your brain. The things that you could do to reduce both heart attack and stroke is know your numbers, know your cholesterol, know your blood pressure, know whether you have diabetes, don't smoke, exercise. All these things can reduce your risk. When you go to your physician, know your numbers, ask what your numbers are, know what your blood pressure are, ask if a blood sugar has been checked. And again, ask how much exercise you should do. Exercise is very, very important in terms of regulating cholesterol, blood pressure, and probably the best amount of exercise maybe every day, 20, 30 minutes of walking. If that's too easy, do more. If you're concerned about your risk of exercising, speak to your physician about it. What should my blood pressure be? Blood pressure is one of the key risk factors for cardiovascular disease, particularly stroke. The blood pressure uh, that a doctor checks in the office is a top number and a bottom number. The top number is called the systolic and the bottom number the diastolic. A simple number to know is 120 over 80 is a rough number. Again, as your blood pressure, the top number goes up 130, 140, 150, your doctor may say you have pre-hypertension or you're developing high blood pressure. The bottom number when it starts to approach 90, that's concerning. It's important to have the blood pressure checked on, on a regular basis, uh, to have it done in both arms. Uh, many patients come into my office and when they come in, they're nervous, they've been stuck in traffic, uh, they've climbed a flight of stairs, and the first blood pressure I get is 170 over 90. And the person says, I never had high blood pressure. Well, that's an elevated blood pressure. The first thing I do is I come back in a few minutes and repeat it. See what they were doing that day. See what kind of medications they were taking. Uh, and at that time, it's, a begin it's very important to take a partnership with your doctor and say, well, I understand I have high blood pressure or I'm at risk for high blood pressure. What do I do? Do you need a pill on the first time that blood pressure is checked? Possibly. So keep a diary, know what your numbers are. Home blood pressure monitoring is also very effective. Um, at many of the uh, uh, super, uh, supermarkets, uh, at drugstores, they sell relatively inexpensive uh, blood pressure machines. You could monitor your blood pressure and use those numbers to approach your physician and say, this is what I am getting at in my home. Uh, do I need more medications? Do I need less medications? So high blood pressure, a goal would be 120 over 80. Uh, monitoring on a regular basis. Don't stop medications without talking to your doctor. Listing the questions about your blood pressure pills before you go to the doctor. Because many times you go in the off office and you feel maybe hurried and you say, well, I, I think this pill is not agreeing with me. Address your concerns. Do you feel tired, lightheaded, headedness? Did you feel like sometimes you get up quickly? Uh, that you feel the room is spinning. This may be the medication may be too strong for you. But in any event, it's something that you could really discuss with your physician and knowing that controlling your blood pressure is going to reduce your risk of heart attack. It's going to reduce, reduce your risk of stroke. I hear a lot about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, but which is which? And what should my number be? When you get a cholesterol number, your doctor will give you a total number and then a breakdown. And if they don't give you a breakdown, ask for it, because that's just as important as the total. So what is a good total cholesterol? Again, it's really dependent upon your risk and what the breakdown is. I often tell people if a number under 200 is probably good for them, but even better is to know your ratio. Well, the bad cholesterol. The bad cholesterol is the LDL. I often refer to it as the L is the lousy. What should your LDL be? Well, it really depends on your risk. Under 160, that's okay. Under 130, that's very good. Under 100, it's great. Under 70, is perfect. If you've had a heart attack and you've had di diabetes, you should have an LDL less than 70. And H, the H is the healthy. The H you wanna have high. How high should it be? Well, the higher, the better. 45, well, that's sort of a borderline cutoff. 50, very good. 60, excellent. 80, 90, perfect. HDL is hard to raise. If you have a low HDL, if your HDL is 25, how do you raise the HDL? Well, obviously don't smoke, exercise. There are some medications that in fact can raise it, but the best thing you can do for HDL is diet and exercise and not smoke. So know your numbers. L, lousy, under 100, very good, under 70, perfect. HDL above 45, okay. Above 50, very good. 
above 60, perfect. And what about triglycerides? Triglycerides are one of the components of cholesterol, and they're probably one of the hardest ones to fully understand and what we should do. And what I often tell people is ask your physician what your triglycerides are. Are they markedly elevated? Are they well above 200, well above 300? Well, then you may have some other problems, particularly when it starts getting four or 500. The most common elevation of triglycerides is from what we do. Triglycerides can be elevated after alcohol use. It could occur related to your diet. It could be more elevated if you're not fasting. The triglycerides are probably an important marker of how you are. It could be a marker of whether you have it risk factors for diabetes or have diabetes. I personally don't aggressively treat triglycerides when they're only mildly elevated. And the reason for that is that the best treatment for triglycerides is manage your diabetes, exercise, lower your total cholesterol. If your triglycerides go markedly elevated, particularly in the four, five, 600 range, and you're not doing those things, you may need medication. I've heard there are many signs of a heart attack, but what are the signs of a heart attack? A heart attack is a sensation of pressure, tightness, or heaviness in the chest. Sometimes it's in the jaw, sometimes it's in the left arm. It can occur with emotion, activity. It could wake you up at night. Many people say it's like a vice, a squeezing, a coldness. Some describe it as an elephant on their chest. If you ever have the experience where there's a severe pressure discomfort you've never had before going on for 5, 10, 15 minutes, call 911. Don't delay. The interesting thing is that women sometimes experience a heart attack differently than a male. What does that mean? Well, they basically can have indigestion, back pain, neck pain, shortness of breath, the sudden onset of generalized fatigue. If this would ever occur, don't take a chance. Go to the emergency room. Don't delay. A few minutes could save your life. Don't call a friend to pick you up. If you think you're having a heart attack, call 911. You shouldn't be driving yourself in. So the symptoms would be Pressure, tightness, heaviness, jaw pain, left arm pain, back pain. Women, and sometimes even men, have atypical manifestations. It could be just an, a right arm pain. It could be teeth pain. Something that you just don't feel right, something different. Breaking out in a sweat. If something goes on for a few minutes and you don't feel right, don't delay. Call 911. Are women also at a risk for heart disease? Women should be very concerned about heart disease and heart attacks. For many years, women were presumed not to have the risk factors for heart disease. Commercials from the 50s, 60s, and towards the mid-80s were women taking care of the men who had heart disease. We now realize that women are just as important, if not more important, than men in terms of reducing their risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In the United States, just as many women die of heart attacks as men nowadays and their risk factors are the same as men. Smoking, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure. So yes, women are not immune to heart disease and just as likely to die of a heart attack as a male. So if you are a woman, ask your doctor, do I have a risk factors for heart disease? How do I mo modify them? Talk about your parents, what they die of. Mention whether you have high cholesterol. Ask what your numbers are. Know your ratios. Know your blood sugar. All these things can prevent a future event. The symptoms of a heart attack can be very different in a woman than a man. It's not always the elephant pressure sensation. Do you have symptoms of arthritis in your back when you walk up steps? Well, don't assume it's arthritis. That could be a form of a blockage. When you feel that pressure when you're emotionally stressed, that may not just be a knot. It could be a symptom of a blockage. If you feel Weakness, fatigue, for no good reasons. This could be a symptom of a blockage or heart disease. Address this with your doctor. One of my family members had a heart attack. Does that mean I'll have one too? Hereditary is a very important part of cardiovascular risk. Your parents having heart disease, having a stroke, could put you at risk for a heart attack or a stroke. If your father had a heart attack before the age of 55 or your mother before the age of 65, you should begin to address this with your doctor, modify your risk. So it really depends on the age of your parent, what they had, what were their risk factors. And just importantly is the risk of your siblings. Did you have a brother or sister who had a stent, a bypass, a stroke before the age of 55? So again, it's age dependent, what your parent or what your relatives were doing. And again, it is something that you can make a difference by modifying your risk factors. You can't change your genes, 
But again, no smoking, monitor your cholesterol, monitor your blood pressure, knowing you have diabetes. All these things go into the context of how your family, uh, what their risk was. What is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is called an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat. This is when the top part of the heart beats chaotically. It's very common. The major risk factor for atrial fibrillation is that it could put you at risk for a stroke. Atrial fibrillation could be associated with high blood pressure. It could be associated weak, with a weakening of the heart muscle. It sometimes can be associated with too much alcohol. It could be associated with thyroid problems. So the top part of the heart starts beating erratically. This can cause flipping, thumping of the heart. It's a very common condition. It gets more common as we get older. It's very treatable. If you have atrial fibrillation, or you suspect that you're having this, make sure you have an EKG. If your doctor tells you you have atrial fibrillation, the questions are, do you need a blood thinner? What is the best blood thinner? What can you do to prevent atrial fibrillation? Again, this is something that clearly needs to be addressed with your, by your doctor in person. Control the blood pressure. Make sure that you're, if you're a candidate for a blood thinner, determine which one. And if you're taking a blood thinner, never stop it without talking to your doctor. Uh, what is heart failure and what causes it? Heart failure is a condition where there's a buildup or a backup of fluid on the lungs. It also could be a buildup of fluid on your legs. It is caused by a weakening of the heart muscle or a stiff heart muscle. A weakening of the heart muscle is where the heart doesn't pump as strongly as it should. The most common causes of a weakening of the heart muscle are damage from high blood pressure, damage from a virus, damage from a prior heart attack. The causes of a stiff heart can be from long-standing high blood pressure, long-standing diabetes. The symptoms of heart failure, again, difficulty breathing, tiredness, fatigue, buildup of fluid on the lungs, waking up at night short of breath. Conditions which can be treated with medications, pills that can actually strengthen the heart, or occasionally if there's causes of the weakening of the heart, there are procedures that in fact can get blood to the heart and make it healthier. If you have any further questions, you could visit our website, winthrop.org, or call our toll-free number, 1-866-WINTHROP.